Terrific, and uh, for both of you, that were, those were outstanding presentations. And certainly if there are questions from the audience, I, I've got like three pages of question, but if there are questions from the audience, please come up to the microphone so we can hear from you. Dr. Davis, you, you can come up to the mic as long as you don't make any UNC comments. <laughs> Sorry, I was a little thirsty. Um, so this is great. Um, <laughs> No, I need to stay passionate and focused on the research. Okay. Um, so one thing that I've tried to do, and I got pushed back a few times from the NIH, um, and I need thoughts. Um, what do you think about women-only studies? I, I study um, women. I find them quickly in the hospital before they leave and follow symptoms, created a map, gone through about 10 years, used the women as stakeholders, have women and gender experts, um, and now we're piloting, following them for 10 days and seeing if we can help them um, recognize a pattern change before they would be readmitted. Um, but we're getting a little pushback periodically of why we're leaving out men. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a big decision in a program of research. Do we pull in the men? And, you know, but what are your thoughts about that? So I'll leave that. Thanks, Dr. Davis. I had several questions like that, but let's get the first impressions. Um, Dr. Khan, are you going to chime in? Sure. And then, uh, Aaron, do you want to chime in? Yeah. I think I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, there are decades to, of men-only research studies that we need to counter, so I think it's okay. But I'm not the funding agency. One example I would suggest is the Jackson Heart Study is a great example of how research changed in individuals who identify as black race by creating an entire cohort of individuals who are black. And I think that doesn't mean that every study in every cohort has to be like that, but it really provides an opportunity to study specific factors and identify and engage a community for that reason and for them. And I think that's why it is important. Dr. Mikos? So certainly, of course, one of the um, most important studies that we had was the Women's Health Initiative trial. Um, we learned a lot um, from that trial, and I know that it was uh, um, very hard to initially convince the, you know, the NIH that you have to fund this very expensive trial at the time it was conducted. Why do a trial only in women? Um, so I think at the question, uh, is what, what the question you're trying to address, I guess, in the trial or the study, because it is helpful sometimes to have men um, as a comparator group because we, it's hard to really understand fully biological and sex differences when you're only evaluating one sex. So depending on the question, uh, I think it would be appropriate to oversample for women to have, um, I think trials need to have quotas and so that you could set a certain quota, like whether it's 75% women, 25% men, uh, and, and I think that you do need to set quotas. If you don't set quotas, you may not miss your benchmark with enrolling. Um, but I, in some cases, I think it's very helpful because a lot of these things sometimes affect men too. You heard from Dr. Barry Mertz that, you know, that this isn't just about women. Uh, men can have non-obstructive um, uh, ischemia with non-obstructive coronary disease. They do. And so, uh, you know, and many of the times it, it is helpful to have, if you're trying to understand biological differences, to have both sexes in the trials. Dr. Shaw, were you going to weigh in? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize exactly what you said in that um, engaging uh, communities tend to be a little bit more robust when they are focused on that particular group. So, you know, Dr. Reynolds ran the HARP study out of NYU, and and I got to see firsthand how how more active, how more likely the women that were approached wanted to participate when they understood that this was trying to study a disease process that. Um, that is that is understudied in women like them, and then you know when we were doing the cold corona study, it was early on in the pandemic, and NIH funded, and that we really wanted to engage the communities that were that were um, hit the hardest with COVID, both our own urban communities as well as minority populations and native populations who did not have access to any of the large research trials that were being run, and to during that experience, I just, it hit me so hard how, how much lack of infrastructure there is right now to engage Native populations, 
uh, communities of color, that, so that when, the, when a crisis hits like that, you cannot just suddenly build trust overnight. You suddenly, you know, you cannot suddenly just say, we want to make an effort today and we have to do it quickly and, and reach out. You need that infrastructure there. And I think having specific trials ongoing for certain communities, keeping that engagement ongoing, builds that infrastructure so that when there is the next crisis, they're more likely to participate as, and we're more likely to be uh, more uh, engaged with those communities. So I, I think that, that leads for a basis for building that infrastructure that we need. So I'm, I'm on for it. Let me pull in two of our non-US participants in the panel. Uh, you both come from countries where healthcare is delivered in a more, one could argue, in a more equitable fashion than it is in the United States. Um, thoughts on the research paradigm? As, as I look at the large trials from around the globe, it's a problem around the globe that we're not involving women, not just in the US. So what, what's the lessons from your countries? I don't think there's much difference. I mean, yes, we're kind of more socialized medicine in Canada, um, but yeah, we face the same challenge. It's hard to get women out there to participate in research. You know, they, you know they're, they're caregivers, right? So they're gonna prioritize their family first and uh, it's, it, it, even sometimes I'll scat population the patient. It's hard to get them to, to consent because uh, yeah, it just, you know, I think that's the same challenge in, in Canada. Yeah, especially for women, it's I think the same. Um, women just have to take care of things. They um, often have not the same um, opportunities if it uh, comes to transportation or other uh, resources, they are disadvantaged compared to men, and that is, is the same in Austria, like in the, in the US, I would say. You know, you go back to the early days of the fibrinolytic trials, and what we observed going back to Gusto I is that if a man had a partner, um, they came to the hospital sooner than a, than a, than a man who didn't have a partner. But if women had a partner, it didn't make a difference. And, uh, and so it does point out some of these issues that are, that are more societal based. That, and we didn't see a global difference, to, to, to both of your points. Dr. Migos, I want to go back to something that you used. Well, I, I guess it was Dr. Khan that said this about the, uh, the FDA and the NIH. Both groups ask investigators to um, tell you what your plan is. And for those of you who do NIH trials, um, you very specifically have to talk about your, uh, your diversity of your enrollment, what your plans are, they track it, but they don't do anything about it. And the FDA browbeats a lot and says, no, 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 we need data on, on uh, different races that are consistent with the U.S., et cetera, but they let us do trials around the globe that don't look like the U.S. Dr. Khan, should, should both funding agencies be tougher on the investigators and not just suggest, which is largely what they're doing now, but really hold us accountable as an investigative community? You know, I, I think of the same example that was brought up in the earlier panel discussion about uh, penalties. So creating reporting structures and then monitoring them and then penalizing when those quality metrics aren't met. Should the same be done for studies? So if there's a goal that's set and there's a plan in place and there are things that aren't necessarily happening according to that plan, should there be interventions so that either a study has to change direction, has to come up with different plans and engage those communities that they're not able to recruit and enroll? I, I think that's an important idea. And maybe it's broader than the FDA and NIH, but it's about local institutional review boards or IRBs. And what is the role of the IRB in requiring that there's a plan and that there's monitoring for the right people being involved in the trials? So I didn't really give an answer, but I think without regulation, nothing changes. Can I yes, add please something do. To that? Because I think one thought is also, yes, they are requesting all these uh, percentages and rates of minority and women, but maybe they should also provide additional funding or re additional resources to actually do that, only asking for us to, do, to enroll women, but not providing any additional um, whatever, funding resources to do it. Maybe that's also a thought. Yep, Dr. Yeah. Shaw, then Dr. Shaw. Yeah, I mean, we, we're seeing so much of that, that, you know, women and underrepresented minorities 
um, end up in a healthcare system more often than not that do not have the resources to even provide um, really adequate telehealth care with home nursing services, right? So something like that, if you have a really good telehealth, and I, I mean an actual video setup and not this complicated like how to, um, or just simply talking on the phone, to me talking on the phone is not really telehealth, um, but having a video set up with a home nurse service, that also then extends as a resource an infrastructure that's there already that you can leverage for research, right? So you're more, the patient's more likely to participate if it's the same setup where a nurse is coming to their home and they're able to uh, liaison with the research team and their physician via a, a video chat setup. Um, so so make, having, a, it keeps coming back to that infrastructure and infrastructure requires funding and resources and it requires, it requires a larger scale um, uh, attention to the way institutions or academic centers or hospitals, community hospitals, how they liaison with the centers that are doing studies. Um, what kind, you know, what are the barriers that prevent rural hospitals, community hospitals from even referring patients to centers that are doing studies? A lot of that sometimes is financial incentives. That's another another uh, infrastructural barrier. So I think we instead of, I mean, yes, it's. Of course, we want to hold investigators accountable, but we really need to work on the underlying infrastructure to allow these things to happen. Yeah, I was going to comment about uh, mandating funding agencies to um, require sex-based analyses before approval of funds. And you know, in the, the two major funding agencies in Canada, Canadian Institute of Health Research and Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, you need that in your proposal. And that's taken into consideration for funding. I think I think that's really, you know, helped uh, these analyses moving forward. Yeah, I mean, so the FDA and the NIH have set, you know, um, recommendations to have increased enrollment of women in diverse populations of trials. But you know, we've consistently looked across all of these um, different cardiovascular trials from cardiometabolic diseases, lipid trials, AFib, and showed that women, despite this, are consistently underrepresented. But you know, one thing that can help is increasing the diversity of the study investigators. You know, it's a, a, not a strong correlation, but you know, we have shown and others have shown that there is some modest association between increasing enrollment when you have more women study investigators um, to have women participate, participants in the trial. So we showed this is, uh, for AFib trials, for example, we published this in JAHA just in, in uh, February that for every um, one uh, additional uh, uh, female increase in female authorship that there was 19% greater women participant enrollment in trial. And it was also shown um, by uh, Dr. Jessup uh, and Dr. Reza for heart failure trials that the correlation was you know, 0.4, so not a very strong correlation, but there is some correlation. So we need a lot more effort in terms of training and equipping women and, uh, uh, and, and individuals who are underrepresented in science and, and medicine to have the skill sets and the competencies to be able to run clinical trials. So that's really important. And then I, again, I'll go back to quotas because I do think you need quotas. I think you need quotas for investigators, but I also think you need quotas for participants in trials. So there is some preliminary analysis, like for example, industry-funded trials you know, who are often um, giving the institutions uh, a certain amount per participant enrolled, that there, you can incentivize more for enrolling women in diverse populations. And so that, you know, when you actually incentivize more for meeting those benchmark targets, actually, investigators are more likely to, to, to reach them. You know, it's not, it's not that investigators don't want to enroll these populations, but sometimes it requires um, more work. There are some studies that suggest that you have to approach more black individuals than white individuals per one enrolled. And, uh, and so that it does take more funding and more investment to really be committed to make sure your trial is, is, is diverse and representative. Because you can do um, sex stratified analyses, but if you're underrepresented uh, women in the trials, then you're not gonna have enough statistical power to really see if there's an interaction or not without having uh, to be, have a, a sufficient number to be adequately powered. I would take your call for um, uh, having more women uh, represented in the investigators e even one step further and, and ensuring there's diversity in, in the investigators, not just by sex, but also by race. 
uh, ethnicity, background, socioeconomic backgrounds, because the barriers that patients face are so unique to the way they have grown up. When my dad had his heart attack, you know, I'm telling my mother, I'm just an intern, and I'm telling my mother, you know, okay, you have to make these changes to the cooking. She goes, how, how do you want me to cut out the oil? And I went online and I found an Indian cookbook by an Indian author from India who my mom knew, had heard of, respected, and it said Indian cooking with a teaspoon of oil. It's been 20 years and she has transformed her cooking in the last 20 years. We're like the healthiest household when we come <laughs> home. Um, but you know, before that, before I could get her that cookbook, she really could not, she could not apply what the doctor was saying to what she was doing at home. And, and so I would, I would say we need to go a step further there. Yeah, these, these are great comments. And uh, in terms of resources, there, there, um, there was just a competition through the AHA for one of the strategically focused research networks on increasing or uh, understanding the science of the diversity of, uh, of clinical research. So those are going to be announced uh, very soon. But the hope is with the commitment of uh, 15, 20 million dollars from the AHA, which is a small amount when you think about the big problem, uh, but still maybe an important amount to, to make some forward progress. And uh, let, let, let's talk a little bit more about the investigators. It certainly, and in, you've indicated this, Dr. Shaw, in the, in the clinical data, there's pretty good evidence that um, concordance of uh, clinician-patient results in a better trust relationship as measured by, in a variety of scales and then results in better outcomes. Um, and you've indicated, Dr. Migos, that, that the same is true in the investigative community. So how do we do it? We, have, we, have, we still have, what, 15 to 18 percent women in cardiology, where a lot of you are working on that to, uh, to improve that. But how do we do it? What, what's the resources that are needed to increase the number of women and other represented in medicine groups as investigators in trials? Well, I mean, it starts with the pipeline, for sure. I mean, it definitely starts uh, as early as, as uh, middle school, you know, um, middle school, high school, when, when kids are starting to think about what could they do in their future. I mean, one of the favorite things I love to do every summer is the cardiac camp and in our local areas where the uh, middle school and high school students get together. And, and I tell them, you know, I, my parents were not wealthy at all. I went to public school just like you. and. And um, you know, there were times when I was just like, "This is never going to happen." But I really, I you know, I figured out what it is I wanted to do and what I loved about it. And and I and I want you to hear that uh, you know, there's no such thing as um, uh, you are not allowed to do something, right? That 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 cer a certain profession is not for you. You have to figure out what you're passionate about. So it does start with the the, the pipeline. But we also need to be more um, engaged with the providers that are out there already who may not be engaged in large academic centers, so that may not have ready access or the opportunities to be sub-investigators. And, and again, I'm going to, you know, just learning from the experience that I had during, during co-corona, I, I recognized that, or it, it was very evident that you needed to be um, more adaptable and flexible in reaching out to sites. So um, to increase our diversity, we, we looked at communities. Um, you know, there was a very large, I'll just give an example, there was a very large um, uh, Hispanic community in Florida, and we chose a large private practice there where the physicians um, were um, uh, Hispanic and they had a very tight bond with their patients. Our study was meant to be a remote study, right? A study that's supposed to be super easy. You just get on the telephone, do a, a computer consent, and everything's done at home by mail. That did not work at that site. They could not, they, you know, as soon as the physician said, okay, call this number, the trust was lost. And so we very quickly changed it saying, you are allowed to do an on-site paper consent. We had meant for it to be easier the other way around, but in this particular community, that worked so much. Our enrollment increased significantly at that site when we changed it. So we have to be flexible and adaptable, and we have to reach out to investigators that are not necessarily, not necessarily have the connections at the centers where the sites, uh, where the trials are being run. You know, your point is so spot on. There's about 5,000 acute care hospitals in the United States. Only about 150 to 200 of them regularly participate in cardiovascular clinical trials. So it's, there, there's, there, it, to your point, there's a lot of people out there 
comment or question? This is a great discussion, and um, I would like to add and echo this um, idea of diversity. But don't forget about your cardiovascular team, because you know it takes a long time to educate a physician and to make that change in the diversity of the physician population when you have nurses, PAs, MPs that could potentially, and they do every day, recruit patients for studies. And so you can achieve a lot of diversity, and, and we have a lot of work to do in the nursing community around our diversity issues, but um, there is potentially a little more diversity in, in that population to help again with recruitment in various studies and particularly when you're trying to get more women. There's a lot of nurses that are women, so trying to get more women recruiting from your cardiovascular team group would be great too. That's 100% correct, and, and we see that um, when, when, our, when, my, when the cath lab team, so because I'm an interventionalist, so that's where I draw my experiences from, when the cath lab team has been made aware of the study and they see the same research coordinator day in, day out in the holding area trying to recruit for studies, the nurses do end up starting to speak about the studies. The techs end up speaking, oh, you know, this doctor is, is running the study. They're going to come talk to you about it. I already know that you're going to be a great candidate for it. And it does change that because one of the biggest barriers that we face is that physicians will tell you, I do not have time to talk to a patient about a study. Well, if the patient has already heard it from multiple time points you know, on their way to the lab, you're coming into a situation where it's, um, you, you know, that, 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 educate, that um, awareness is already there and they're walking into it. You're, you know, you're walking into it where everyone's given a little piece of their time to the enrollment of this patient and you're more likely to succeed that way rather than putting the onus on one person. Go, go ahead, we'll, we'll have one more quick one before we break. Sorry, I have two possible suggestions, questions, concerns perhaps. One of the, one of the things I think can help for those of us um, who are practicing in a very, very, very small community, I'm talking, you know, a town of 100,000, um, we don't have, I don't have access or time, in all honesty, to go and keep looking for ongoing um, research that is happening or to enroll. You know, going back to being able to enroll more female patients as a female physician, there's only a handful of us out there even today. So. In a setting like this, where you have access to female physicians, perhaps investigators could reach out to those individual female physicians and say, hey, by the way, there is this study happening. Do you think you would want to be part of it? Only I say that only because, like I said, I don't know what's happening. And two, ACC has, you know, um, Go Red for Women program, and my hospital um, does do that, but it's more a heart health. It's not focused on just female heart health. Perhaps, you know, February the Heart Health Month, maybe centers that are um, STEMI accredited, chest pain centers, maybe ACC or AHA can set a guideline, say, hey, if you are accredited, you have to have uh, education for women's heart health, or, um, you know, you have to have a dedicated program. Maybe that would help get more awareness of what really is happening in the community. I'm not sure, sure how feasible it is, being such a large organization, but perhaps something that can be done just to get more local small communities involved in it. So gr great comments to bring this session to a close. Um, uh, Dr. Khan had mentioned it at AHA, Research Goes Red, which I know several of the leaders in the room are involved with, is designed to get to part of your question, but, obvious, but it, it does need to be promoted more. And then secondly, both AHA and ACC are very interested in using the backbone of the registries to begin to reach out for more research engagement, particularly through the centers that aren't quite the big ones that, that both you and Dr. Shaw have noted. So thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. Dr. Moran, I'll bring this session to a close. I know that you have time for a break now. And uh, thank you all for participating. <laughs>